Hello, everyone. We are excited to welcome you to our webinar, the Community Reinvestment Act and Regulation BB. We hope you enjoy this afternoon's presentation. My name is Rita Garwood, and I am on the marketing team at Temenos. Before we begin our presentation, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Your phone lines have been muted in order to eliminate any sort of background noises or disruptions to today's presentation. With that being said, we encourage all of our attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation using the chat or Q&A feature in WebEx. Questions will be compiled and answered during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to answer as many as possible within our allotted time. If we do not get to your question, we will answer it on an individual basis and have it to you within one week. Today's webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording as well as the presentation slides will be distributed to everyone who is registered within the following week. Today's presentation will be led by two members of our compliance team. Before transitioning this presentation over to them, I'd like to hi highlight Temenos Talks. Temenos Talks is an educational platform which offers a variety of resources including webinars, blogs, white papers, and more to the financial industry. The intent is to promote innovation, thought leadership, and collaboration among not only the Temenos customer base, but the industry as a whole. Our presenters today are members of the Temenos compliance team. Cindy LeBlanc and Matt Gobel are senior compliance advisors with Temenos. I'd now like to hand the presentation over to Cindy to get us started. Thank you, Rita. And thank all of you for joining us today as we consider the following components of CRA. We'll look at a brief history, and then we'll go over some definitions. The delineation of assessment areas. We'll discuss various performance tests for the various size institutions. We'll look at data collection and reporting, the public file, and last but not least, notices. So let's get started. CRA is a community effort. A successful program involves not only your CRA officer, but also the board, senior lenders, marketing, retail, and commercial departments within your institution. It's important to ensure that CRA is woven into the fabric of the institution's overall strategic planning. You need to establish and communicate your goals for CRA performance. Because without a formal CRA program, you're throwing darts blindfolded. Now, the Community Reinvestment Act, CRA, was implemented in 1977. The primary purpose was to increase credit opportunities made available to low and moderate income neighborhoods with an emphasis on small business and small farm loans as well. And down through the years, there have been several revisions. With the latest, effective January 1st of 2018, this latest revision coincided with the changes in HMDA and resulted in a change to the public file contents with regards to the HMDA disclosure statement, as well as the removal of home equity loans as a category of consumer loans that would be reviewed upon request. References to the NSP, or Neighborhood Stabilization Programs, were also removed. And in considering the various historical changes, we don't want to forget the interagency Q&As. Those interagency Q&As were recently updated in 2016. And the Q&As are a valuable tool to use along with the regulation itself. So you'll hear me talk about that a little bit later in the program. And with that being said, Matt, will you lead us in a discussion of some of the definitions, please? My pleasure, Cindy. Let's start with the definition of affiliate as it's used under CRA. An affiliate is a company that controls or is controlled by or is under common control with another company. Affiliate does include subsidiaries of your institution. This definition will come into play when determining gross revenues as well as determining whether the allocation of lending activity reported between your institution and its affiliates has been purposely influenced in your institution's favor. This is discussed in more detail in the interagency Q&A number 22. 
An assessment area is an area delineated by the bank. Um, the assessment area consists of whole geographies and includes areas where all deposit taking branches and deposit taking ATMs are located, as well as where the majority of the institution's loans are originated or purchased. We will discuss assessment areas in more detail later in this presentation. Community development is discussed in great detail in the 2016 interagency Q&As, as Cindy previously mentioned. Uh, community development is defined as affordable housing, including multifamily rental housing for low or moderate income individuals, community services targeted to low or moderate income individuals, such as providing technical assistance on financial matters to nonprofit, tribal, or government organizations serving low and moderate income housing, or economic revitalization and development needs, uh, to, name, to name one. There are several examples listed in the interagency Q&A under uh, number 12, so it'd be worth taking a look at that there for some additional examples. Activities that promote economic development by financing businesses or farms that meet the size eligibility standards of the Small Business Administration's development company or small business investment company programs or have gross annual revenues of one million or less or activities that revitalize or stabilize low or moderate income geographies, designated disaster areas, or distressed or underserved non-metropolitan non middle income geographies. These distressed or underserved non-metropolitan middle income geographies will be updated annually, and you can find that list on the FFIEC's website. A community development loan is a loan that has a primary purpose of community development and except in the case of a wholesale or a limited purpose institution, has not been reported or collected by the institution or an affiliate for consideration in the institution's assessment area as a home uh, mortgage, small business, small farm, or consumer loan unless it is a multifamily dwelling loan and benefits the inst institution's assessment area or a broader statewide or regional area that includes the institution's assessment area or areas. Community development service is one that has its primary purpose, community development, is related to the provision of financial services and has not been considered in evaluating retail banking services. Community development activities are considered within the performance context of CRA examination for large banks, intermediate small banks, wholesale and limited purpose institutions. Small institutions may use community development activities to assist in receiving consideration toward an outstanding rating. A consumer loan is defined as a loan made to one or more individuals for household, family, or other personal purposes. Geography is a census tract delineated by the U.S. Bureau of Census. You will hear us use the terms geographies or census tracts throughout this presentation. Home mortgage loan is a closed-end mortgage loan or an open-end line of credit as defined under HUMDA. So moving along, let's discuss income levels within geographies or census tracts. Understanding the thresholds of the various income levels assists you in determining how you are meeting the needs of the various individuals within your assessment area according to their income levels. Low income is less than 50% of median income. Moderate income falls within 50% to 80% of median income, and middle income hits 80% to 120% of median income, and upper income is over 120% of median income. The loan location depends upon the type of loan. So for a consumer loan, the location would be the geography or census tract where the borrower lives. If the loan is a home mortgage loan, the location reported on the CRA LAR will be the one where property is located. For small farms or small businesses, you have the option to either report the location of the main farm or business or the location where the majority of the loan proceeds will be used as provided by the borrower. Other terms you will hear within the CRA discussion are Metropolitan Division and Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA, which are both defined by the Office of Management and Budget. A non-metropolitan area is any area not located within an MSA. A qualified investment is an investment with a community development purpose. Examples of this type of investment could be those made in CDFIs, new markets, 
tax credit eligible community development entities, CDCs, minority and women owned financial institutions, community loan funds, and low income or community development credit unions. Others include not-for-profit organizations serving low and moderate income housing or other community development needs, such as counseling for credit, home ownership, home maintenance, and other financial literacy programs to name just a few. So continuing with these definitions, a small bank is a bank or savings association that had assets of less than $1.28 billion on December 31st of either the past two years. Going a step further, an intermediate small bank is a small bank with assets of at least $321 million as of 1231 for both of the last two years and less than $1.28 billion as of 1231 either of the previous two years. When a bank or savings association meets the intermediate small bank threshold, since there are no CRA loan data reporting requirements for, for an intermediate small institution, as there is with a large bank, its next examination will be under the intermediate small institution examination procedures, even if that examination comes due during the institution's first year as an intermediate small institution. A large bank is defined as a bank or savings association with assets at least $1.284 billion as of December 31st of both of the previous two calendar years, and large institutions are subject to CRA loan data collection that cannot be examined under the large institution examination procedures until they have at least one full year of data collected. In addition, any size institution is afforded the option to choose to be examined as a large institution provided that has collected and reported the required CRA loan data. Thresholds can change annually and are posted on the FFIEC website. So rounding up the definitions, let's look at small business loans and small farm loans. A small business loan is one that is one million or less and meets the definition of loans to small businesses on your institution's call report. Small farm loans are loans that are 500,000 or less and meet the definition of loans to small farms in the call report. So Cindy, now that we have briefly reviewed a few definitions, can you discuss assessment areas with us? I am happy to do so, Matt. An assessment area consists of the area where the majority of your business is conducted. Like Matt defined earlier, it uh, includes the loans originated and purchased, as well as your deposit-taking branches and deposit-taking ATMs. Now, when defining your assessment area, an LPO, Loan Production Office, may be included in that assessment area. However, do not make an, an assessment area just for the Loan Production Office unless your specific regulator has defined your specific Loan Production Office as a branch. Now, assessment areas must consist of whole geographies or census tracts, cities, towns, counties, townships and Indian reservations or governmental units which are considered political subdivisions for delineating CRA assessment areas. Wards, school districts, voting districts, and water districts are not considered political subdivisions for assessment area purposes. So when creating an assessment area, you take into consideration the actual area served by your institution. The assessment area should not be so large that it includes geographies greater than what your institution can reasonably expect to service. Generally, you do not take only part of a political subdivision. However, in the case of where there is a natural or geographic boundary, such as a river or a major highway, a mountain that divides the area, then you could consider splitting the political subdivision if it's needed. You cannot combine two separate MSAs into one assessment area unless they are both part of the same CSA. Now let me say that again because it can get confusing. You cannot combine two MSAs into one assessment area unless they are both part of the same CSA. Also, take into consideration things like whether there are uh, military bases, land masses, large airports, etc. within the region. 
You want to be able to identify those areas and support why you are making the selections you do. Because we all know we do not want to get caught in a redlining effect. Understand your assessment area and be able to discuss the competitive, economic, and demographic landscape of your market area to your examiners. Track lending opportunities in your community and any work with government businesses or nonprofit partners. You do need a good foundation and understanding of the community you serve. You understand the population income, the housing needs. Those will assist you in participating in a healthy discussion with the examiners. By understanding the demographics of the community within your assessment area, you will be able to determine what types of products and services you may consider to offer to your community. And another thing to consider is your staff. You want to make sure that your staff understands your community as well. And that will come in under training and, and the buy-in with everyone in your, in your institution to supporting you with your CRA efforts. Now, while delineation of an assessment area is a required component of CRA, the assessment area can also assist your institution in making sure that you're meeting your, communi your community's needs through providing data on loan and deposit penetrations. By mapping the assessment area, an institution can readily detect the locations where efforts have been focused to meet needs within that community it serves. Studying the lending patterns and credit requests from the various census tracts located within your assessment area also provide insight to areas where loan coverage could be increased. What you see on your city map can help you prevent redlining. Now, moving forward, under the performance context of CRA, institutions that are not small banks are graded on three different tests, lending test, investment test, and service. Under the lending test, examiners will review lending activity within your assessment area. This includes the number and amount of home mortgages, small business and small farm loans, geographic distribution across the assessment area, especially in your low to moderate income areas, and dis distribution across customer profiles. Paying attention to low and moderate income individuals, the number and dollar amount of community development loans, and the innovativeness or flexibility of your institution's lending practices. With the investment test, documentation of the purpose of the investment along with the geographic area the investment provides support to strengthen the CRA program. The investment should generally benefit the institution's assessment area or a broader regional area that includes the institution's assessment area. So if you have, for instance, you have a company that offers um, support or they offer, um, uh, they're doing multi multifamily housing and whatnot, and their uh, area that they take in and includes your assessment area, but the project that they're working on right this moment does not include your assessment area, you may still be able to utilize that. You just have to dig into their background, understand what, they're, um, what they are doing, and make sure that, that they are including your assessment area in their regional um, plan. So the investment test evaluation is based on the following. The dollar amount of qualified investments, innovation or complexity of those investments, responsiveness of the investment to credit and community needs, and the degree the investments are not provided by other investors. So you want to make sure that you have innovation and, and complexity, um, that you're flexible, and that not everybody else is doing the same thing. You kind of want to look for that outside the box type of project. 
One thing to keep in mind is that you cannot double count activities under the lending and the service test. So you either count it under the lending or you count it under the service. They won't let you double count it. So when you're looking at this, consider qualified grants, donations, and con contributions. Those are some things to consider, for example. The third test is the service test. And this encompasses the distribution of the branches within low to moderate income geographies. And then branches opened or closed in those geographies. And any alternative delivery systems such as your LPOs, your ATMs, your online banking, bank at work, mobile banking, bank by mail, those are all alternative service delivery items. The range of services and products available to low to moderate income individuals and that are available within low to moderate income geographies. And the extent and innovativeness of the community development services. Now once the exam is completed, you get a rating. And that rating will be assigned specifically to your institution. Those ratings are outstanding, high satisfactory, low satisfactory, needs to improve, or substantial noncompliance. And Matt, are the small and intermediate small banks evaluated differently from the large banks? If so, would you take us through their evaluation steps, please? Great question, Cindy. There is a difference in the evaluations of the small and intermediate small banks unless they choose to be examined under the large bank procedures. Let's take a look at those evaluation steps starting with the small bank. Small banks will be evaluated on the loan to deposit ratio, the percentage of loans made in the assessment area, recording of lending to various income levels in small businesses or farms, geographic distribution of those loans, and the record of responding to written CRA complaints. When evaluating the loan to deposit ratio, examiners will look to the, at the institution's capacity to lend consider the capacity to lend in comparison to other similar institutions and review the geographic, excuse me, the demographic and economic factors within the assessment area and the opportunities for lending within that assessment area. When considering the percentage of loans made in the institution's assessment area, the goal is to ensure there are more loans made inside the assessment area than loans made outside the assessment area. Moving on to intermediate small banks, the evaluation components consist of, consist of those used in the small bank test as well as the number and amount of community development loans, number and amount of qualified investments, the extension of community development services, and the bank's responsiveness to community development needs. The ratings for both the small bank and the intermediate small bank are outstanding satisfactory, needs to improve, or substantial noncompliance. There are two other types of institutions that are evaluated under CRA. Those are wholesale or limited, person, limited purpose excuse me, institutions. The institution's record of helping meet credit needs of their assessment area are evaluated through community development lending, qualified investments, or community development services. The community development test is based upon number and amount of community development service, innovative or complex qualified investments, community development services and the extent to which they are not provided by private investors, and last but not least, responsiveness to credit and community development needs. So Cindy, what about strategic plans? How do they fit in? Well, Matt, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> An institution may choose to file a strategic plan and be examined on that strategic plan. The strategic plan will have to be resubmitted and approved at least every five years. And the plan must include measurable goals, solicit public, uh, solicit public comment, and be approved by the bank's regulator. The strategic plan must also be included within the institution's CRA public file with appropriate confidential information redacted. Now, ratings for all of the various institutions are published. A poor rating could be a negative factor when trying to open a new branch, relocate a branch, convert a charter from one regulatory agency to the other, 
or in a merger or acquisition opportunity. So Matt, would you now discuss the data collection and reporting requirements, please? Sure, Cindy, thank you. A large bank must report small businesses and small farm loans. Items to be reported about those small businesses and small farm loans are the loan identifier, loan amount at origination, loan location, and whether the gross income is one million or less. Reporting is due annually each March 1st report the amount and number of loans greater than 250000 and to borrowers with gross annual revenue of $1 million or less. So community development loan data is also required to be collected. That data consists of aggregate number and aggregate amount purchased or originated. If you are a HMDA reporter, then you are also required to report the location of each mortgage application, origination, and purchase outside the MSAs in which the bank has a branch or home office in accordance with HMDA. Now, for those institutions that choose to have the examiners consider consumer loans, there are four categories of consumer loans that will be considered. Those are motor vehicle secured, credit cards, unsecured loans, and loans that are secured by collateral other than vehicles or residences. The data required to be reported about those consumer loans consists of a unique number identifying the loan, the loan amount, loan location, and gross annual income of the borrower. Now, Cindy, we know the institutions are required to have public file. Are the requirements the same for all institutions? Great question, Matt. There are a few differences depending on the category of the institution. Generally, the public file requires the following information. Written comments from the public and responses to those written comments from the current year and previous two years. Of course, you are required to redact any information that may negatively reflect on the person's reputation other than the bank. If, it, if it's negative against the bank, you still have to put it in there. You'll include the public section of the most recent CRAPE, public evaluation. A list of the bank branches, and this includes the street addresses and the geographies or census tracts. A list of any branches that have been opened or closed in the current year and the previous two years. And you'll also be required to include the street addresses and the geographies or census tracts for those items as well. Next, you'll have a list of all the services and loan and depo product, uh, deposit products that are available. You'll include a map of the assessment areas, and the map must contain the boundaries of your assessment area as well as the specific census tracts or geographies of the areas that are included within those assessment areas. Now, you do have a choice of including the census tracts on the map itself or creating a separate list. I find using the census tract on the map itself is a, a better tool for me because then I can see exactly where those are located and it's a visual tool that I like to use. And there are tools out there available for the map creation. Then you can also include any other information that you choose. Some banks choose to put more in that's re than that's required. That's your choice. Weigh the risk before you put that additional information in there, though. You want to make sure that it's not going to open up a can of worms for you down the line. Now, if your institution is a HMDA reporter, then you must include a written statement that uh, the bank's HMDA disclosure statement may be found at www.consumerfinance.gov slash HMDA. If you're examined under a strategic plan, then you must also include a copy of the strategic plan, redacting any confidential information that may have been included with the plan when you submitted it to the regulators for approval. And if you have a less than satisfactory rating on your most recent CRA exam, then you are required 
to include a description of your current efforts that your institution has undertaken to improve that CRA performance on the quarterly basis. So you'll have to update it quarterly. Even though the regulation requires the file, file to be updated by April 1st annually, you do not wait until April 1st to update that performance improvement effort because those are required to be done quarterly. Now, if you are a large bank, you must also include the CRA disclosure statement in the public file. If you choose to have a consumer loans reviewed, then for each category of consumer loan, you're required to include the number and dollar amount of loans that are made to low, moderate, middle, and upper income census tracts, and those located inside as well as outside the bank's assessment area. Moving on to small banks, you must also include the loan to deposit ratio for each quarter of the prior calendar year. You have the option of including additional loan to deposit information if you choose to do so. And if a small bank chooses to be examined under the lending, service, and investment test, and you have chosen to have consumer loans reviewed, then you are required to include the number and dollar amount of loans that are made to low, moderate, middle, and upper income census tracts and those located inside as well as those located outside of the bank's assessment area. The entire public file must be updated by April 1st annually and must be available for review at the institution's main office and one branch in each state in which the bank operates. The branch file includes the public section of the CRA PE and list of services and products available at that specific branch. Now, you may want to keep an entire public file copy at each branch if you choose to do so. There's no prohibition against it. And one thing to consider is the updating of the file. If you keep an entire file at each location, you've got that many files to make sure that you go in and you update and keep it current. The CRA public file must be made available for review at any branch and within five days of a request to view it. Now that's, you've got five days to to get the information that has to do with the assessment areas where that branch is located. A copy of the CRA file must be made available upon request. And although you cannot charge an individual to review the file, you are allowed to impose a reasonable copying charge. Now I wouldn't go charge $100 to copy the file, so you want to look and see what's reasonable. And there again, that's a risk assessment there to determine what's reasonable for your area for a copying charge. And when the public requests to see the file, I recommend that you track those requests. You really want to know who is asking to see that file. That's going to help you as you develop your CRA program going forward as well. And it will help eliminate surprises if anyone comes to you um, with negative feedback when they're looking at that file. I remember a bank that I worked at years ago, and I was CRA officer there, and we had a particular individual who would come to the banks in that, in that corridor of the United States and examine public files constantly. And this particular individual and his group were looking for any disparate impact, a disparate treatment to to certain um, groups and so we had to stay on our toes and we wanted to make sure we knew when that person was asking to see our file. Now if you choose to keep your public file on the institution's intranet internally, you're not required to keep a hard copy or a paper copy. However, I always kept one because I would update it and scan those updates to the electronic file. That way I knew what I, what I had when I updated it and how current it was. If you keep the file on the internet, then you must follow the requirements for both the branch and the main office file timing requirements. 
You must be able to print it out and reproduce it according to the time requirements in the regulation anytime someone requests to view that file. Matt, now that we've discussed the public file, can you provide some guidance on the public notice requirements? Sure, Cindy. There is a spe uh, specific public notice required to be posted in the lobby of the main office as well as the branch offices. Appendix B to Regulation BB contains a notice form for the main office and a separate notice for the branches. Now, Regulation BB is the Federal Reserve's regulation found at 12 CFR 228. You will need to ensure that you are looking at your specific regulator's side to ensure you are including the correct information. Just for example, OCC is referenced as 12 CS, uh, CFR 25. Uh, 12 CFR 195 pertains to federal savings associations, and the FDIC's citation is 12 CFR 345. Uh, so make sure you're looking at the correct uh, regulatory citations there, depending on your institution. So as we wrap this up, I want to leave you with a few resources which can be found here on slide 40. The link is to the FFIEC's website for CRA. That is where you will find the interagency Q&As uh, for data reporting software, exam schedule, annual CRA asset size threshold adjustments for small and intermediate small institutions, a list of distressed or underserved non-metropolitan uh, middle income geographies, exam procedures, public evaluations, and FFIEC census and demographic data, just to name a few. The information found on this site will assist you in managing your CRA program. Save it to your favorites. It has a wealth of information and guidance. Reviewing the CRA exam procedures and the CRA public file evaluation modules are extremely helpful in preparing for your next CRA exam. You will also note that we have listed the various regulatory citations for banks and saving associations. We will now turn it back over to Rita for questions. Thank you all very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy and Matt. At this time, we are going to address the questions that we received from the audience. For those of you who still have questions, please remember to submit them through the chat or Q&A feature at the top of your WebEx screen. The first question we have is, we are a small bank in a rural area. If we extended our assessment area, what would we need to consider? I'll take that one. This is Cindy. Uh, when making adjustments to your assessment area, you should consider whether the institution has the ability to market to and serve the area that you're looking to include. An assessment area must consist of whole geographic areas whole census tracts. And remember, cities, towns, counties, townships, and Indian reservations are governmental units which are considered political subdivisions uh, under for delineating CRA assessment areas. And wards, school districts, voting districts, and water districts are not considered political subdivisions for assessment, assessment area purposes. The assessment area should not be so large that it includes geographies larger than what your institution can reasonably expect to service. Now, the benefit to enlarging your assessment area would allow more areas for loan penetration. However, you must make sure you can provide retail delivery channels for that increased area as well. And also, the area must be in the same MSA, CSA, or contiguous to your existing assessment area. Otherwise, it's going to be a separate assessment area. So assessment areas must include either a branch and or a deposit-taking ATM. Thank you, Cindy. The next question is, can, loan, can a loan be reported on the CRA LAR as a small business loan and also be listed for credit as a community development loan? I'll be happy to answer this one. Um, unless the loan is a multifamily affordable housing loan, it cannot be double counted. Uh, you would be required to report it as a small business loan if it meets the definition of a small business. Thanks, Matt. Next Glad question. If we invest in an SBIC, 
is a participation in a specific project that is not in our assessment area, that investment would still qualify as long as the SBIC services a geographic area, including our assessment area? Um, I'll tell you this one as well. Um, where the Small Business Investment Company, or SBIC, uh, does include your assessment area as part of the region it invests in, you would be able to count your investment in that SBIC even if the current project is not directly benefiting your assessment area. Thanks, Matt. Would you explain how to report a renewed small business loan? I'll take that one. Um, if the renewal of the loan occurs in any year other than the origination year, then you may count the entire amount. For example, if you make a 40,000 reportable loan in 2019, then in 2020 you add 10,000 to the loan and refinance or renew the entire amount of 50,000, you may report that entire 50,000 in 2020. Now, on the other hand, if you make the $40,000 and you loan and you report it in 2019, and then a few months later in 2019, you decide to refinance or renew the loan and add $10,000 to it, you cannot report the original $40,000 again in 2019. But you can report the additional $10,000 in 2019. So you'll have two loans for that person. You'll have a $40,000 loan and you'll have a $10,000 loan. But you can't report a renewal in the same year that it was originated. Thanks, Cindy. Here's another question. We have been an intermediate small bank examined under ISB procedures. However, we became a large bank as of 12-31-18. Our next CRA exam is scheduled for 2019. Will we be examined as a large bank at that examination? I can take this one. Um, no you will need to have one calendar year to collect that before you are eligible to be examined under the large bank procedures. So until you have that first full year of data collected, uh, you will not be examined under those large bank procedures. Thanks, Matt. Um, another question here. Um, are we required to create a CRA committee? I'll, I'll take that one. No, you don't have to cre create a CRA committee, but it is a proactive step to encourage buy-in from the various departments in your institution. I remember years ago when I was a CRA officer, um, we had uh, different locations within the state where we were, so we had CRA committees in each state and I mean in each area of that state in each re region because it helped us to know exactly what was going on not only in that institution but in that community so that we could serve it better. CRA should be embraced by all areas of your institution to ensure you have a strong foundation. It is important to educate the various members of the board and the management team to ensure your program is in sync with the institution's overall strategic marketing plan going forward. Now, I'd like to add a little bit um, to that. When I talk about the strategic marketing plan, I don't know how many of you are involved in your, your institution's annual SWOT analysis or your strategic planning, but you want CRA to be so ingrained in your staff and in your management team that that is definitely a consideration. Anytime marketing wants to roll out a new program, you, you've got to consider the CRA implications and, and how are you servicing, how is that new program going to service your low to moderate income individuals or the, the areas of your assessment area. You want to ensure that you include and think of all of these different things when you're putting together your marketing plan. And, and that's where a CRA committee comes into play because that way you have input from each area and you're 
institution becomes a well-oiled machine because everybody is working together and it's woven into the fabric. I like to use that as an example. You know, like a basket weaver is weaving a basket or or um, the the fabric of of your institution's life. You want to make sure that CRA is a big part of that. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Um, here's another question for you. We have demand notes that we review annually, but we do not renew them or extend them. Would those be considered renewals under CRA reporting requirements? I'll say this one. Um, no, a demand loan that is merely reviewed annually is not reported as a renewal because the term of the loan has not been extended. Um, so kind of a so, so no is the answer to that one. Thanks, Matt. Um, another question for you here. What kinds of complaints would we place in the CRA public file? Ah, I'd like to answer that one. <laughs> and no, it's not a complaint when your um, customer comes in and says, I don't like the perfume your teller wears. It makes me sneeze. <laughs> it would not be something like that. But actually, examples of the types of complaints that you would include in your CRA public file would be complaints regarding the hours that your branches are opened or closed. Uh, branch locations um, are the lack thereof. If you're closing or relocating a branch, you might have complaints about that. Someone might come in and, and really take issue with it. Um, lack of certain products, loans or deposit accounts, or possibly alternative delivery method, methods, or, or when, if, they, if they don't like the way that your products operate, or they feel like your fees are too high compared to the market area and uh, and your your competitors out there um and again if they if they feel like that you're missing a, missing an opportunity in a specific area a physical location that they they might like to see another branch or an atm um th those kind of things that's what you would that's what those are the kind of complaints that you would put in the, the cra public file thanks cindy Here's another question. We just acquired two new branches. Do we need to update our public file now, or can we wait until April 1st? I'll, I'll take that one again, if I may. If you, uh, I would like to tell you that the regulation states that the public file must be current as of April 1 annually. However, I always tell uh, my customers that write in and ask us questions, where you've recently acquired those branches, I recommend that you update that public file with the new information now. I don't recommend that you wait until April 1. You, you merge in uh, August, or you acquire a new location in August, don't wait till that next April to update that file. You want your information to be current and fresh, and, and you want to be shown that you're on top of things and you know what's going on, so that's my recommendation, that you update it as, as soon as you do uh, finish the merger and the, the merger date or the acquisition date. Great. Thanks, Cindy. We've got one final question here. What are some common reporting errors noted on the CRA LAR data? I'll be happy to take this one. Um, some common reporting errors on the LAR are going to be uh, like reporting non-reportable loans, um, reporting an incorrect loan amount, or reporting an incorrect geocode or loan location, and reporting um, incorrect gross annual revenues. I would say those are some of the most common um, errors that we see you know, that, uh, through our compliance advisory service here at Timinos. Um, those are certainly, like I said, the most uh, commonly discovered errors. And if I may step and say one one other thing that you you know you want to consider possibly scrubbing your data before it's time to uh, before it's time to report it, just go over it and make sure that you are that one that the staff that's inputting the information understands what they're supposed to be inputting, and two that everybody's on the same page and you've got the correct information. 
Thanks so much, both of you. This is a great presentation. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording as well as the presentation slides will be distributed to everyone who is registered within the following week. For more information on Temenos Talks resources and upcoming webinars, please visit the website shown on your screen. Sorry about that, not showing. <laughs> Thank you all for attending, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.